Okay, so we are approaching uh, the time when we will need to, to start uh, our session in, uh, in a minute. And uh, we are very happy that people are joining us from all over Europe and the world. Um, my name is Irina Volongavicene. I am from Lithuania, from Vytautas Magnus University, and also from Eden Digital Learning Europe Management Board. It's a great pleasure for me to open the session uh, that is dedicated to uh, discuss and answer some questions uh, uh, aiming uh, to achieve uh, our uh, vision on how to support teachers and how teachers can become open teachers and open educators. And this is uh, the session uh, dedicated uh, today specifically for the Open Education Week that Eden organizes uh, for the sixth year already. And this week is the Global Week, the Global Week of Open Education. And these uh, events in Europe also contribute to global events dedicated to open education. And moreover, I would like to take this opportunity and to dedicate the session and our discussions to Ukrainian teachers in higher education, in schools, and also school, te school teachers and school children and students, and to demonstrate the great sovereignty with Ukraine and to support these teachers in the best ways we can. So uh, actually, uh, we uh, prepared this session together with uh, the colleagues that I will introduce very shortly. Uh, thinking uh, about uh, uh, the discussion that we would like to hold with you, the session participants and also teachers all over the world on how uh, school uh, teachers and teachers in higher education could take better advantage of existing possibilities to open curriculum, to use open educational resources and to contribute with their teaching uh, towards open education in general by co-creating learning content curriculum through open professional collaboration, as well as co-creating knowledge together with their learners and students at school, at university. And uh, we want to discuss the enablers uh, of teachers to become open educators, including digital competencies needed to create and share digital content and open educational resources, as well as to discuss the challenges that teachers face uh, when they are uh, contributing towards opening up schools and universities. And it is my pleasure today uh, to have such great colleagues uh, around the table, if I may say so, together with me, uh, that I would like to introduce very shortly to you. So first of all, I would like to introduce Elena Calderola, Director of eLearning Center at the University of Pavia. Elena has been working as Director of the Center since uh, 2010. Uh, and uh, uh, Elena actually is uh, also taking very important roles in uh, Coimbra Group uh, Task Force, uh, firstly with the e-learning task force and then with the Education Innovation Group since many years. And Elena Caldirola is also a member of Executive Committee in Eden UK. Thank you very much, Elena, for joining this session. Also with me today, I have the pleasure to invite uh, and to, to greet here colleagues from Vitotas Magnus University, uh, Dr. Stella Dokshiene, uh, who is a researcher and also uh, researching various European projects, but also within Academy of Education uh, and teacher trainer for online learning at the uh, Institute for Study Innovations at Vitotas Magnus University. Her research focuses on virtual mobility, technology application in classroom, online teaching, open educational resources and practices, and digital credentialization. Estelle is also the president of Lithuanian Association of Distance and e-learning, which unites about 50 Lithuanian education institutions. 
Thank you, Estella, for joining. As well as uh, Associate Professor Elena Trepule, a researcher from Vidodas Magnus University and also a researcher at Lithuanian Research Council projects, a lecturer at the Education Academy. And Elena's research is related to technology-enabled learning, digital competences of educators, and digital and micro-credentials. Welcome, Elena. Also together with me, here you have uh, Jochen Ehrenreich, a senior researcher at DHPW Heilbronn from Germany. And Jochen is, uh, research focuses on concepts and enablers for digital and open learning and teaching. Erasmus Plus projects like OE Pass, MicroHE, ECHO, EDICO, with Jochen's contribution, developed European approaches to micro credentials and digital credentials. Jochen built his expertise in the fields like university governance, quality assurance, lifelong learning, research based learning through hands on project work and implementation at various higher education institutions. Before joining DHBW, he developed a new approaches to technology transfer and lifelong learning at the University of Freiburg and was responsible for study program accreditation and quality assurance processes at Esslingen University of Applied Sciences. Welcome, Jochen, to our team. And then uh, I have great pleasure to introduce a group of researchers from University of Aveiro. So first of all, Professor Antonio Moreira, as leading specialist and researcher in education, having authored several books, chapters, articles, and educational and research software. In addition to different teacher education programs, he coordinated the Nonio Seculo, uh, 21st, I'm sorry for my pronunciation, local competence center, and the digital contents laboratory at the University of Aveiro, in which he was the founder and was the director of specialization training courses and master's course in multimedia education. Antonio supervised internships and several master, doctoral, and postdoctoral theses and dissertations, and is a leader in research and project work with a scope of cognitive flexibility hypertext in learning, communities of practice, and random access instruction. Uh, welcome, Antonio, to the session. And also to your team, uh, that is Anna Balula, uh, uh, who participated as a researcher in several scientific projects. And uh, the main research areas of Anna are e-learning, b-learning, the use of digital technology in education, e-assessment, evaluation, open educational resources, collaborative online international learning, English for specific purposes, foreign language didactics, and intercultural business communication. Anna has also been a member of scientific committees of international congresses and journals and is currently involved in Erasmus Plus and Horizon 2020 projects, focusing on innovative practices and digital competences. She's an active member of Collab, Collaborative Platform of Teaching Innovation in Higher Education, a digital platform whose goal is to establish an interactive and collaborative educational resource center open to teachers, professors in higher education. Welcome, Anna. And uh, the last but not the least, Sandra Vasconcelos, uh, also from, sorry, Sandra, for the pronunciation of Portuguese surnames, also a researcher from uh, University of Aveiro. And in addition to teaching English for specific purposes, Sandra is a member of e-learning and pedagogical innovation unit of the Polytechnic of Porto and an advisor for distance education at School of Hospitality and Tourism and Polytechnic Institute of Porto, having an active role in the development and implementation of teacher training workshops that promote innovative methodologies and pedagogies. Sandra is in research projects with a scope of tourism education, e-learning, b-learning, English for specific purposes, informal learning, interdisciplinary practices, and the use of digital technology in education. 
Thank you very much, uh, Sandra, for joining us. And now I introduce the, all the presenters. And we start our uh, presentations immediately following uh, our agenda. And we will have uh, short presentations up to 15 minutes. Then we will uh, invite the presenters to answer the questions from the chat or question and answer session. So please attendees be active in, in discussions and the posing the questions. And then if we have time at the end of the session, we will come back and rediscuss uh, what is still uh, not answered maybe in the session. So it is my pleasure, first of all, to invite uh, the, uh, Elena Calderola from University of Pavia with her presentation on resetting education, resetting teaching, challenges and perspectives for an open approach. Please, Elena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Irina, and uh, thank you very much to Aden uh, European Digital Learning for this uh, invitation. It's really a pleasure for me uh, to stay here together with you and together with uh, the participant to this webinar. Now I can uh, share my screen. Okay and in presentation mode. That's perfect. OK, uh, so uh, my presentation is uh, uh, challenges and the perspectives for an open approach. So you can see it, um, from the first slide that the focus of, on, of my presentation will not be just uh, or only uh, the teacher, the professor, but the approach. I really think that uh, this is a very uh, important way uh, to see uh, the context because it is, I think it is <laughs> very, very difficult to be an open teacher in a closed context. So my idea is that an open teacher can be an open teacher in an open context, okay? So just to start with um, a smile in this turbulent and tremendous time, <laughs> I, it was my pleasure here to identify a couple of comics. <laughs> Sometimes uh, uh, just in the first comics, it is so so funny to, to, to learn that sometimes uh, when we uh, think at the teacher, we don't think at the teacher as a work. Or in the second, the comics is, uh, okay, uh, the education is the backbone of civilization. That's why in our school, the nurse is a chiropractic. <laughs> so it is, it is true. Um, in this uh, last time, uh, education, uh, training, uh, and the role of teacher is changing so quickly, so rapidly. And uh, the idea is that now is the time to reset, to rethink, and to... Um, to put down uh, a system for a better undertake the, the best learning and teaching system for the best citizens of the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, recently, I had the opportunity to take part uh, in a very, very interesting uh, training week uh, organized by the, um, a new European project called Enote, a European network for uh, teaching excellence. Um, it is a project funded by the European Union uh, on Erasmus Strategic Partnership Framework and uh, combined around the partnership uh, that you see below, so University of Leiden, of uh, Coimbra, of uh, Carlo um, of Praga, University of Praga, Carlos V, University of Copenhagen, and the Global Governance Institute. Three main points uh, so interesting about the um, uh, goals of this project. The first one, uh, please, uh, I want to remind you my first sentence, um, open teacher in an open context. So this project bring together not only teachers, but university managers, teaching faculty, support staff, PhD supervisors, students, and education expert. So please look at education, at the process of education, look at it as a team of people working about the um, topic of teaching and learning. Second, 
The project, this project addresses core issues related to teaching excellence in the post-COVID context, including best, practic best practices in physical, online, and hybrid teaching realms. Of course, all of us know that the COVID uh, was really a, a great uh, and a great and incredible point, new point of view about how to look at the process of education. And the third, and very, very important, Enote seeks to prepare a blueprint for a European certificate of teaching excellence. This project um, has, uh, as, a, uh, as a, how can I say, previous experiences in Europe, two very important European projects, and a report from the University of Coimbra Group. Uh, the first European project is promoting a European dimension to teaching announcement. So a feasibility study from the European Forum for Enhanced Collaboration in Teaching, EFFECT project, uh, with uh, really the production of, of a very um, important and relevant documentation. But you have uh, the link and then you can uh, search for yourself which is uh, the, um, the results of this project. Another very important project from um, the European uh, Agency, the uh, European Agency for Special Needs and Inclusive Education, the Teacher Professional Learning for Inclusion. And the third, last but not least, a very relevant report prepared by 33 universities from the Coimbra Group, that is the response to the COVID crisis, what have we learned so far uh, from the crisis of COVID and key messages for recommendation coming from these 33 universities. The Coimbra group is a group that keep, keeps together um, more than um, 33 uh, universities. Um, they are long established, uh, prestigious, multidisciplinary university in Europe. From uh, Joachim Kops, the coordinator of uh, this uh, training week, uh, there are some interesting uh, um, view what, about the teaching excellence. Uh, we can look at teaching excellence in so many, how can I say, uh, uh, relatives, <laughs> competence, which is teaching, teaching excellence, competencies, or quality, or effectiveness, or impact, or engagement, or inspirational teaching, or enhancement, or successful. Each of these items contributes uh, to the a good uh, shape of uh, teaching. But uh, to do this, to do this we have to consider best practices, policies, outcomes at different levels. Different levels, it means individual, departmental, national, European. So not only the single professor, not only the single teacher. All of this can contribute to desirable student, what, learning outcomes, of course. So, just to have a very short and uh, simple and easy definition, excellence can be an end state, but more often is an aspirational goal. And such an aspiration every day is changing because it, uh, of course, comes from a peer-to-peer -peer inspiration and continuous improvement. So excellence every day is to face with the real time, with the time that we are um, together living uh, in education uh, processes. Um, of course, it includes well-being consideration and inclusion for staff and for students. For this reason, the report coming from the Coimbra Group of University is strictly linked with the research of Joachim Cops because this report uh, was prepared and to focus uh, on eight main uh, topics, and you can see them here listed down. 
But uh, as a final remarks, uh, the creators of the report uh, noticed that there are horizontal issues across the, the eight dimension uh, under study. And the horizontal issues are here uh, evidence, uh, post, um, put, put in evidence. The main horizontal issues are these four. Um, we have to focus our attention on the professional development of the teacher, the well-being of the institution, uh, sorry, the professional deve development, not only of the teachers, but of the uh, entire components of the academic communities. So staff, uh, governance, students, all the people that together uh, give the contribution for academic community. Then we have to consider the well-being, the well-being of uh, the academic uh, uh, community and the factor of inclusion. Please think at reality when you <laughs> turn on TV and uh, you look around you what is uh, uh, happening uh, in the world about a so state of no inclusion and no well-being status for a lot of people living in this world. So uh, absolutely, of course, education, especially after mm -hmm. COVID, have to keep in consideration these two paramount factors, inclusion and well-being. And of course, post-COVID-19, post sorry, the digitalization the factor of digitalization. These four factors are acting together in order to transform, and these four factors are horizontal around a lot of other topics that the report uh, had as under focus. Main challenges, flexibility and willingness to adapt to, do, to new learning and teaching environments, generally speaking environments, they can be physical environments or virtual environments or mixed. But the idea is that this environment has to be flexible and have to ensure wellness. Widespread use of blended teaching and learning solution. So no more the idea to stay in presence or to uh, reach a university abroad, but to create a combined solution for this. Continuous professional development for all the people that give a contribution in academic uh, community for education. Internationalization of curricula is another very important point. With more internationalization, probably we will be able to understand. We will be able to speak. We will be able to share. We will be able to include people. So absolutely, mm, today, education post COVID-19 and seeing what we are, we are uh, considering uh, in, in this incredible war in, in Europe, we have, um, the, we have to, to underline the goal that internationalization and inclusion is a very, very paramount factor for us. And human resource dimension uh, in leadership, in collegial discussion, in peer-to-peer -peer exchanges between teachers in interdepartmental meetings, for example, and in supporting teachers-student interactions, because we have to uh, underline another time that education, first of all, is an agreement, an agreement between an institution, teacher, education, and students. So uh, the idea in my mind and uh, in the minds of the organization of that week is that uh, we have to consider an open stuff, an open institution approach. Only an open stuff, an, an open institution can create an approach to the open teacher. This is the way. In fact, teaching excellence is an aspirational goal Link it to a continuous, open-minded process of self-improvement, but at all levels. If this is not the case, the overload will be 
on the shoulder of individual instructor. And this is not correct because this is not a matter of uh, uh, one man show. This is a matter of an effort of an entire institution and not only institution, but, but uh, an effort from state and an effort from Europe because we have expectations in this as a community, as a civil community. And second, the strive for teaching excellence need to be supported at all levels. Why? To adapt to changing needs, changing needs of a community, of a civil community, changing needs of students and core stakeholders. Because the world is changing and is changing very, very quickly. So moving forward, and uh, this is the, the, the second uh, European project that I mentioned, promoting a European dimension to teaching uh, announcement, the EFFECT project. How to realize this? Because, okay, words, 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 but we have to find some tools, we have to find some instruments, we have to find a roadmap in order to um, eff effectively um, put on the table uh, these, re these uh, reforms. So uh, the idea is to create, uh, and this project tried to do it, an institutional strategies support package. Uh, you can uh, have an idea in, uh, have a look to this, uh, to this uh, project and you will find 10 principles. This 10 principle <clears throat> focused from the project um, put, the focus, put the focus on we, what, what is nowadays the meaning of education at higher uh, education level. What, what is the meaning? Which are the goals? Why we should um, think at the importance of education, teaching and training? Why? So uh, this project, the creator of the responsible of this project was able to create, to write down 10 principles. With this 10 principle, there are for each principle uh, some guiding questions. The idea is this is the principle, these are the questions, and the idea is how your institution is able to uh, give, uh, give um, the, the proper uh, activity to this principle. Is your institution on the way to? So the idea is a sort of exercise in which people from the governance, teachers, students can answer to these guiding questions and write down a roadmap in order to be able to achieve them. Maybe uh, after my presentation, if there will be time, we can see uh, together the 10 principles, but for these 15 minutes, I would like to limit my presentation to the main, uh, um, to the main uh, uh, goals of the presentation. If there will be time, we will uh, look at them uh, together. So we can, in a certain way, to write down a sort of to-do list in four point, in order to promote and foster this new meaning of education in Europe. The first two, funding are required. And not only for teachers, but for the development and continuation of more sustainable, systematic institutional approach, institutional approach, because it is very, very difficult to be an open teacher in a closed institution, you can imagine, because this only uh, means that uh, the single teacher have a lot of workload on his shoulder. And for example, in Italy, uh, to fight against uh, uh, rules of the ministry. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we need a systematic institutional approach for learning and teaching, allowing the higher education institution to develop structures and policies for innovation announcement. Two, collaboration at European levels, but not only at, at European levels. For example, create peer-to-peer -peer group, create European project, 
create, like the Inote project, an idea of a European certification. So the, the idea is to collaborate in an open approach in order to give a contribution and to create the big picture of this. The last two, this announcement is explored practically in a lot of projects in, in Europe, everywhere. And there is a trend to enhance it, to provide a more systematic way, another time the word systematic or system. As some sisters are ahead, there is a good opportunity here for exchange and mutual learning. In fact, if you look at the documentation of EFFECT, there are um, some countries particularly advanced in the order to recognize and answer in teaching. I can mention, for example, Netherlands and Norway and other countries that have uh, a lot of uh, load, uh, a lot of, um, uh, of road to, to, to walk, <laughs> on walk too, <laughs> in order to achieve the same result. So maybe the countries with the better uh, setting can help or can show how to uh, create the best systematic environment in order to open and be open-minded. And last, recognition of teaching as a part of the academic careers. This is very important, this is very relevant, because uh, uh, till uh, the teacher is evaluated only for research, any effort uh, will be perceived as unuseful. And so uh, this is a very uh, a challenge for, uh, for uh, the system, but we are calling to a reflection for this. Also, in view of a wide range of tasks and academics performed behind teaching and research. And we have, of course, to remember that the best research may be come from a best teaching or vice versa. And this, at the end, and to finish my presentation, not just for a theoretical idea or some, how can I say, uh, academic inspiration, but after COVID-19, after the globalization, after all the things that are happening in the world, there is an entire world that uh, has expectation in order to change education, in order to change the meaning of teachers. So we have to go along uh, this path to meet social, social expectation of millions of people in the world. So this is my idea, to go for open, to go for excellence, to go for a new settings, to go for a resetting education, because we have to do this for a better world. So thank you very much. I will uh, um, invite you to the, to the next conference in Tallinn of Digital Education uh, Europe. And uh, I agree absolutely with the Eden Digital Learning Statement that absolutely to ensure solidarity and support the sovereignty of uh, Ukraine. Thank you again, Irina, for your kind invitation and uh, thank you to all of you for your patience to, to listen to me in this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. That was really a very impressive uh, opening, I would say, presentation with really a very wide uh, uh, scope of considerations. Um, I don't see a question so far in the chat, and I encourage people to, to pose their maybe reflections, comments, or questions. But uh, and, and I see congratulations uh, from the chat to you. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, may I ask a short uh, maybe question to you that raised my interest. Uh, it, it is regarding um, the needs uh, from the students. You mentioned that actually, of course, we understand that uh, the needs of the students are um, become priority for, for teachers and institutions. 
in terms of opening up, uh, um, did you, maybe you have some reflections on the discussions in Coimbra group or in the project that you mentioned? You mentioned several dimensions, including uh, environment, uh, including uh, enhancement and collaboration and recognition. Which of these dimensions were more relevant for students? Which of these dimensions were reflected in the students' needs? I think them, uh, listen to them in, in uh, that very interesting uh, um, training week was the idea uh, to, yes, to stay together in peace. Uh, there was there were a lot of students coming uh, from the University of uh, Leiden or Copenhagen, but staying there, coming from all over the world. And the idea is to create a map of inclusion. So uh, how we can study together and share the same environment and learning together with a teacher that con is considering us as uh, in, in an inclusive way. This was uh, the main engine <laughs> that I, I hear from us, not the career, not the competition, uh, not to be the first, but the idea to create um, a well-being community. Uh, it is so important to, to hear this and to underline and to stress it, because this want young people to stay together in peace, to learn together in peace, to share culture, internationalization, for example. And it is not so important to be present, to be in presence or online, but the idea is to be considered as people, as person, not as number, not in large group, but the idea to have an exchange with their peer or the professor. This is the main goal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. A really big applause uh, from me. Unfortunately, we need to move on now with, with the other presentations. And I would like to invite now the second and the third, I think, speakers, two speakers from Vitotas Magnus University, Estela Dokshiene and Elena Drepule, uh, who will uh, introduce the research results on uh, uh, the and, and the answers to the question, how to increase the openness and readiness of teachers to share and become open educators. Please, Estella, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you a lot. Um, I would say that, of course, there are probably a lot of ways how to open up and how we discuss how each of us can open up and to become an open educator. What I will be presenting is our research uh, that we have done several years already ago, but which was very rich in the results that uh, we can share. And mainly the background, what we did is that um, uh, we had in the university, we had a project uh, where we participated. Uh, we were not developers, but we were a piloting university which had to pilot the open educational research platform called SlideWiki. And uh, together with this pilot uh, testing of this platform, it was an idea to provide our teachers, our university teachers with the uh, uh, idea that they can create their slides uh, that they use for their courses. If they do their in blended courses or online courses that instead of regular slides, they create uh, uh, slides as open educational resources in the SlideWiki platform. So we come up with this kind of idea. We suggested our teachers, we trained them, we presented them on the platform, how to use it, on how they should proceed. And uh, out of this idea, we also did uh, research, uh, researching on how this uh, OER creation or transferring their courses, opening uh, their slides, changes their attitude towards their pedagogy and uh, uh, towards open educational resources, how it changes what they do in the course and uh, are there any changes in how they understand what are open educational resources and uh, what changes. So mainly, mm, 
we did this design-based research and we had uh, the research methods we applied. We uh, provided uh, a survey for our teachers before the trainings about open educational resources and the platform uh, to assess what is their initial um, attitude towards uh, open educational resources. We used uh, the um, scale that was developed and validated in other, by other offers. And we just did the survey, first of all, before we started the activity, then we measured their attitude change after they have created these open slides. And uh, once again, uh, what to, if, if there was any uh, change in their attitude towards OER after they have piloted those slides with their students. And also, um, after this process, we did uh, um, some structured interviews with all of those teachers who participated. We have totally 15 teachers who uh, voluntarily participated in this kind of uh, research and testing of platform, and, but also uh, with their real input as creating open educational resources. And now some of our uh, research findings. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, we thought that it would be a change in their skills because the, they have developed, we have uh, introduced them how to develop uh, open educational resources, and they did this uh, creating open slides. And uh, in, in the scale, we also saw that they increased their skills, they know more, better how to um, create those open educational resources. But what was surprising that in the interviews, we found out that it, it was not only the change in skills that they have improved. It was their confidence that after this kind of activity, they knew what kind of skills are necessary. And most of them even said that we had those skills, skills even before creating open educational resources, but without uh, uh, ever thinking that we are creating them and without uh, knowing if we are doing right, we didn't think that we had those skills. So it was mainly what we found out is that their confidence that they are able to create open educational resources was uh, the main uh, thing that we also never thought about. Uh, what else uh, uh, from those surveys that we presented with them on how their attitude changed using this simple activity like opening up their courses with open edu educational resources or open slides? Uh, uh, first of all, uh, the biggest probably change was saw that uh, uh, before those green uh, columns are or numbers are how they saw it before development open educational resource, the light green is after development and uh, the darker mm, green is after testing those uh, open slides with the students. So the biggest change probably was that uh, even after this kind of simple activity, they saw that o OER, open educational resources, fulfill uh, the needs of their students. Okay, they, This kind of idea that never come, probably never come up for them before and also, they saw it as a, their responsibility to create those resources. They saw that they increased the population, but the other maybe um, findings, uh, we saw this attitude changed. The, it was increased in all the lines uh, what we uh, researched on, but mainly uh, they saw it as... Um, uh, opening up and making, uh, seeing, uh, making more available, also contributed, uh, think that OER contribute to their organizational reputation and promote collaboration. And uh, out of interviews, uh, uh, we did the 15 interviews with the teachers, uh, uh, some structured interviews, what we found, how the simple activity in your slides, uh, uh, we saw that it, um, it might change your pedagogy and you know, how you teach. Uh, first uh, change what uh, teachers uh, um, draw attention to was that, uh, of course, uh, uh, revising their slides, it had an impact on their 
curriculum creation process. And uh, this led to, to most of the teachers or half of the teachers even uh, reviewing assignments. They even uh, um, thought or changed their assignments in uh, um, thinking about that students can also create open educational resources. Okay, so the, and the, they also saw that this led to more student-student interaction and the possibility in the platform, they could provide comments and they could provide, uh, they could redo the slides. Uh, this is the, the tool provided them. So uh, they saw that students were also checking those slides, they were commenting on them, they were um, engaged in these kind of activities that you usually don't see in just regular slides. But as they were uh, accessible openly and the students could connect and could, connect, uh, and could comment or add on their ideas, they saw that students were more engaged in this kind of uh, activity that came from open uh, slides. Also, what teachers mentioned, what was required from them to do, uh, first of all, when they had to uh, um, the idea was that uh, we let them choose what kind of slides they want to make as open educational resources. So the first thing that they indicated, it required the revision of course topics because not maybe not all course topics can be made as open educational resources. It required the revision of the whole course topics. It required also uh, presenting the idea for the students what are open educational resources and embedding this as one of the course topics because if you want them to do something with open educational resources they have to understand what it is so um, even though that teachers only changed their slides to open open slides uh, this led to to changing a lot of other things in the course and also uh, what teachers mentioned a lot that it required revision of the slides content because if you want to, so it was like kind of inventory of what kind of slides and what kind of learning materials you have prepared and which of them can be made open. And also it required revision of uh, uh, the authors the, uh, of uh, what kind of uh, resource they are quoting, if they can make these slides open depending on the resource they are using. Okay, so it was a lot of additional activities uh, that might not even be seen before you start this kind of activity. Uh, and also teachers what stressed and what they uh, quoted that uh, they felt more responsible when they made their slides as open educational resources. Uh, uh, they thought about each word, which maybe they were not exact or not precise in their uh, regular teaching activity when they were just preparing the slides for the students. Also, they mentioned that this kind of uh, revision and updating was necessary because uh, uh, if you create an open resource, it, uh, not all topics are good for this, but also you need maybe sometimes maybe to make it broader so it is more understandable for other people, not only your students, or you need, need uh, maybe to make it uh, less broad, maybe more narrow or more specific or more concrete in explaining this. it. So it is understandable for not, not only specialists of, of certain courses. And uh, uh, what else it can be uh, those, yes, responsibility from teachers, the accurate citations, the revisions of topics, the revisions of uh, uh, selected resources and uh, to checking if you can really make it public or sometimes even you have to choose another a resource if it is uh, it can be used uh, you know in some closed platforms but if you want to make it public maybe it doesn't allow this kind of activity and once one more thing uh, we also looked at what kind of challenges those teachers faced so uh, in this opening up 
uh, of course, uh, may, or most of the teachers said they had to overcome this openness barrier because in the beginning they were, you know, stressed and not sure if they are doing the right things. And uh, uh, sometimes even uh, some teachers even said that they didn't f- thought that they had this kind of barrier. But when doing this kind of activity, they found out that they had to overcome. So in general, they were happy with this opportunity okay, to overcome this barrier. But they also saw that this opening up uh, was a barrier for the students as well, as there were still some students who could not overcome and who could who would still ask if they could do just regular slides, not the open slides, not to make them public. Uh, um, so it, it was uh, a challenge that was overcome by most of the teachers, but not by all of the students. Uh, also, teachers said that... Um, uh, this change, this opening up changes a lot of things and sometimes not all students understand it perfectly. Uh, even with the activity when students created open educational resources, uh, not all teachers were sure that their students understood what it means and understood what kind of challenges uh, you meet when you create your work openly. So uh, it means that it depends on uh, students in the field, probably the students study. And one more thing that we found out and which was also um, a challenge for the teachers, it was the platform itself. Uh, Just to making up a conclusion, I would say that a user-friendly platform to create open educational resources or a platform that is user-friendly to share those resources are really necessary. As uh, the issues and challenges teachers face, they were a lot related to the platform uh, which was still piloted, which was st- still not fi- finalized. And um, it was annoying for the teachers. And uh, they even mentioned that this might lead that I won't u- be using it in the future. But if it is really a good platform, I, uh, if it, uh, the, the bugs are fixed, I would use it in the future. So a tool, it means a lot. It's very uh, important so that the tool is user-friendly because it will help teachers to decide disseminate and to open up. So briefly, these are the results that we found found in our research and that we wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Estella, and also for the timekeeping uh, very well. But that's maybe why you have already a couple of questions <laughs> from the audience. So the first question is, did the teachers mention the change of their workload being bigger when going open, for example? How did you uh, or how did they solve that problem if this was noticeable? Uh, well, they did not mention the bigger workload. They mentioned th- that the, the responsibility in preparing the slides was bigger, but they had already like prepared slides before. And you as a teacher usually uh, prepare for each lesson. Okay, So this was like an additional work to prepare for the course, but we took it during the summer so they could do these kind of slides during the summer. So they, they were not focusing on some like additional work to create uh, uh, slides as uh, open educational resource. They more mentioned that the needs of the skills that they thought that they were not able, but that then they found out they more that they can and and how what kind of impact it, it, it had, but not the workload itself. And the other two questions uh, I think relate to with the collaboration. Uh, and uh, uh, did you notice any uh, solutions here uh, regarding collaboration of teachers? Uh, to 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 co-create such open educational resources. It's difficult. Uh, maybe Ilana wants to answer. <laughs> uh, maybe thank you, Stella, for your explicit uh, presentation of the results. Uh, uh, regarding the uh, cooperation of uh, teachers and co-creation of uh, of the resources. Uh, 
uh, particularly in that platform, uh, teachers were creating their own slides, uh, each uh, presenting uh, uh, their own resources. But um, I think it was the exercise of practicing uh, openness um, in, uh, in creating materials, what was very beneficial to teachers. And uh, it's like you may not start swimming if you do not get yourself into water. And when you get into water, then it's when you may start feeling that the water is uh, getting you up and that you may practice some swimming. So these teachers, they practiced uh, uh, cr creating open resources and that created both confidence for them and also their awareness of how they are uh, to behave it, it being in, uh, in open. And also answering Johan's question about licensing. Yes, uh, they were rethinking. Uh, I do have uh, this very good picture, but um, I'm not sure where I have, have I got it and what is uh, its uh, license. So maybe I'm going to uh, to search for pictures that are uh, free to be used. And then perhaps I show at the end of my slides um, uh, the source where I was using my pictures, even though they were free. So it was a new experience of um, uh, responsibility. And I think uh, for many teachers, it was um, a new feeling. And... Um, the same to be said about technical challenges. Uh, uh, they were also uh, an experience of, uh, well, all platforms have deficiencies, but it's not my problem. <laughs> so I just need to learn navigating. It's what we learned during COVID when we uh, juggled with so many tools uh, and we understood that it's okay that I do not know all the platforms perfectly, um, I will try and I will learn. And um, uh, this is also uh, increasing your openness in, uh, in co-creation of uh, resources. Uh, uh, for example, in Moodle, uh, in our university, we have uh, many courses that are being shared by several teachers. And um, I think we have... Uh, to learn how to tolerate uh, your colleague uh, contributing uh, to the content. And uh, thank you sure. very much, ladies, for a very interesting presentation. Unfortunately, we need to move on. Uh, and um, if you have questions, don't stop asking them and also answering them in the chat, because I hope that all presenters stay there with us until the end. Now I invite um, uh, Jochen. Uh, with, the, with the next uh, presentation, actually uh, a little bit shifting the topic, but very interesting focus. So Jochen Ellenreich from DHBW uh, uh, presenting EDICO Learning Maturity Model for Digital Education Competence. Please, Jochen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Irina, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, I will present the EDICO Learning Maturity Model, which is based on Digicomp Edu. Some of you might have seen some of the results already, but of course we have progressed in the past year. Um, EDICO is short for Supporting the Development of Digital Competences of edu Educators. The project started two and a half years ago. And First, we created a learning maturity model for uh, digital education competences, uh, um, and, and it was based on a re review of digital competence frameworks for educators, and uh, mainly the Digicom Edu framework and tuning Kalohi uh, descriptors. <clears throat> Currently, we are um, uh, developing a self-assessment and recommendation tool and a directory of learning opportunities and open educational resources. And we have already identified over 500 OERs for digital uh, education uh, competence development. So um, we uh, 
base our work on DigiComp Edu because it is uh, uh, the European standard. And uh, we have added uh, several competence areas, uh, micro-credentialization and recognition in the assessment uh, area, uh, gamification in teaching and learning. While we had some discussions that gamification, in fact, is only a uh, a method for teaching, but uh, we considered it uh, important enough to be a separate uh, category. Agile working, and then a new category health um, with the subcategories dealing with health information and health conditions, interaction and intervention, and improvement of conditions and prevention. Um, other uh, digital competence uh, frameworks have been updated as well, and uh, we see quite some similarities between our uh, thinking and our developments and the developments of those uh, frameworks. So, when we, uh, what we then did is we um, developed uh, descriptions of knowledge, skills, and attitudes for three levels of expertise explorer, expert, and pioneer. And um, and um, I will switch now to the browser. So um, you see that um, Digicom Edu has um, six proficiency levels. Uh, Digicom has uh, eight proficiency levels. Uh, um, we reduced them to three, Explorer, Expert, and Pioneer. And um, as I mentioned, we uh, described them in uh, knowledge, skills, and attitudes categories. These are the new dimensions. Um, and then a look at the dimensions themselves. Uh, Gamification, uh, to use gamification elements such as challenges, competitions, points, badges, and leaderboards to make the learning experience more enjoyable and the learning outcome more sustainable. The explorer level is, uh, um, knows what digitally supported uh, gamification is and how it applies to specific samples, skills, uh, is able to apply a digital, digitally supported game, gamified process in teaching and learning situations to improve students' involvement if he or she is provided with the technology and attitudes, general interest in digitally supported gamification processes. And uh, then we also have expert and pioneer levels. Um, for micro-credentialization, maybe uh, the description is to design batches credentials that contain all the available information to facilitate recognition of intermediate achievements. Maybe here I will pick the, the expert level uh, for knowledge, has advanced knowledge of the processes of designing micro-credentials on the levels of micro and macro curriculum level and is able to explain the links and metadata between the credential and digital curriculum in a virtual environment, skills, uses and explains the credentialing system to issue digital credentials, consults on the process of designing digital credentials and peer reviews, uh, micro-credentials developed on the micro and macro curriculum level and reviews, as well as updates the metadata for credentials on learning outcomes assessment method, EQF level and so on from IT systems such as digital curriculum in a virtual learning environment and attitudes, cur curiosity, towards digital and micro-credentials as a means to support the principles of learning outcome uh, recognition and ECTS transfer among the European higher education area. In recognition, to, uh, to judge information provided in a learning credential and additional information to recognize skills and competences towards a larger credential. Let's look here at the pioneer level. Knowledge knows and improves the institutional guidelines and tools. And uh, in the light of uh, 
recent discussions and updates of the relevant principles and regulations for re recognition of formal and non-formal learning skills, explains, creates, and implements continuously and, and implements and continuously improves institutional procedures and tools for recognition and so on, um, and attitudes, uh, commitment to ensure that the same level of criteria for recognition is applied across the institution and to further develop a recognition database within his and her or her institution. Agile working uh, defined as to empower learners in an interdisciplinary team to collaboratively develop a rapid prototype of problem solving that creates value for the user by employing agile and iterative methods. And then, then the health categories, which are especially important, as uh, Elena uh, Calirola has also mentioned, to be aware of the health impact when using digital technologies and to be able to communicate, interact, or intervene with regard to physical or mental health of learners, as well as oneself being educator, to discover and pre prevent pre potential hazards and con contribute to improvements. And then we have the subcategories, dealing with health information and health conditions, to be aware of the health impact and to be able to explore health-related information, to monitor own and learner situation and apply evaluated information for framing meaning meaningful use of digital technologies in learning processes. Uh, category 7.2, interaction and intervention to support the healthy use of digital technology and maintain a positive interaction with learners or peers regarding health issues to offer or seek support of evidence if evidence requires. And then finally, improvement of conditions and prevention to explore, discuss, and implement measures and improvements regarding learners' health, learners' and own health, to foster own and learners' ability to employ digital technologies for the sake of health. And then I will switch back to the PowerPoint. So um, the conclusions from two and a half years of working on digital education, uh, digital competences for educators is there is no single correct model for digital competences, uh, but on a European level, there's a convergence of approaches uh, towards knowledge, skills, and attitudes, and, uh, and of competence frameworks on the basis of DigiComp or DigiComp Edu or related frameworks. On a national level, Approaches and models can differ substantially. We observe that small countries tend to be early contributors to and adopters of European concepts, concepts, while large countries tend to develop their own national discourses and approaches. Um, this is sometimes a bit frustrating for me in Germany um, that uh, we have a very a strong German language uh, discourse uh, that is sometimes decoupled from European developments. And um, uh, other conclusions are that health and safety are emerging as important new categories. And there are plenty of open learning resources related to digital education, but many are outdated or not well maintained, and many are difficult to discover. Uh, so maybe it is more sustainable to publish an open access book or a PDF than a, an open course that will not be maintained uh, in two years time. So um, these are the learnings that we had from um, our uh, work so far. So the Questions. Thank you, Johan. I was following, and actually, it was me who was <laughs> posting the questions uh, to the chat. Uh, so, still looking forward uh, to 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 replies. If any, you you really introduced a very interesting approach that smaller countries usually 
uh, really adopt uh, European concepts while large, larger ones uh, establish uh, national models and to try to have their own um, models for that. Um, I, I don't see questions right now in the chat, uh, but it would be really interesting what the audience think about new proposals for competency areas. Uh, and uh, and let's see. Um, my my question to you, Jochen, would be: uh, How uh, would you see the uh, digital competence areas uh, in terms of the um, best potential for opening up? I think what Estella was uh, presenting uh, might do with the uh, with the uh, resources, uh, digital resource uh, competence area. Uh, but uh, uh, teaching and learning was not touched upon, and uh, you introduced also interesting areas that were introduced in EDICO. Uh, do you, what kind of potential do you see here for, for the opening up, maybe resources for teacher training or, um, or something else? Are there any challenges related with the opening of these resources? Um, let me answer in a different way. Um, so I see that we, we come from a higher education perspective and um, we, we um, and, and the teacher training is often at different institutions. So um, a challenge is that um, those activities, so continuous professional development for teachers in schools and uh, for higher education educators um, have very little contact points, but they could benefit a lot from, uh, from exchanging their approaches and ideas and, and um, Maybe this would be one of the areas where uh, the new European Digital Education Hub could uh, be active uh, in fostering dialogue between competence development for higher education teaching and competence development for school teaching um, and uh, bringing those cultures and, dial uh, and uh, concepts uh, together. Thank you, Jochen. I hope so. I really hope so. It's a nice initiative and I hopefully will find the link there between the two levels of education. Thank you very much. Uh, you receive warmest uh, uh, regards from Romania. Uh, thank you for, for these regards. Um, and now we have to move on. And uh, I invite uh, then uh, the team from University of uh, Aveiro to share with us uh, how University of Aveiro is uh, enhancing and supporting teacher collaboration. The title of the presentation is Collaboration for open teaching the case of the collab platform at the University of Aveiro. So please, colleagues, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Irina. I'll just try to share my PowerPoint with you. Hopefully you're already seeing it. And I'll try, I'll try to start by introducing the team. Well, our, our presentation, Antonio will kick things off. And afterwards, I will mm -hmm. jump in and send it at the end. So, Antonio. Okay. Um, well, good morning, everybody. And uh, uh, thank you for uh, inviting us to this event. Um, well, as uh, Irina uh, unveiled, we are uh, going to share with you on the topic of collaboration for open teaching, uh, the case of the CoLab platform at the University of Aveiro. Um, this presentation uh, is, uh, is going to be done by myself and, uh, and, with, and by Anna and Sandra Vasconcelos. 
So uh, when you, you think in how to become an open teacher, uh, the quest is that uh, one's got to be flexible enough and be open-minded enough so as to uh, accept co-planning and co-teaching as one of the aspects that um, is important to keep in mind. Uh, this, in, in its turn, uh, brings uh, a boost to academic rigor and increased understanding of students' outcomes. Uh, as at the same time, it allows you to increase creativity in lesson planning and classroom management, and therefore reduce teacher isolation through communities of practice. Uh, these are important elements that I now give the floor to Anna so that she can continue. Uh, community of practice, okay, uh, sorry. Uh, community of practice is uh, uh, usually regarded as a group of uh, practitioners of whatever uh, profession. Uh, here we are thinking in terms of teachers uh, who share a common concern, a set of problems or an interest. Uh, a topic and who come together to fulfill both individual and group goals, shared practice, repertoire of resources, experiences, stories, tools, problems, uh, anguishes, whatever that is available in terms of being a topic for reflection and co-reflection. The focus of com communities of practice is sharing best practices and creating new knowledge to advance the domain of professional practice. So interaction on and on and on an ongoing basis is an important part of this endeavor. Um, the purpose of a community of practice is face-to-face -face meetings as well as web-based collaborative environments to communicate, connect, and conduct community activities. And Actually, I think it's me. <laughs> oh, sorry. Standard. It has to be dynamic. There you go. Yeah. yeah. There you <laughs> and within this setting in which collaboration, openness, and, and co-creation, they are very, very important. These communities of practice that has, as it has already been said, are essentially groups of practitioners working together and in a way enabling um, each other. These groups, these communities, they can actually become catalysts for open teachers. Um, and going back to one of the key topics uh, of the panel, they can also become catalysts for the creation and the development of um, open educational um, resources. But going back to the to the slide, so how can we or how do you come about creating these, these communities? There are different uh, guides and guidelines that outline the, the core principles of communities of practice, all of which underline the importance of fostering a community environment, promoting collaboration, um, and having an open platform which will be able to endure over time and be sustained by the different uh, members. So these communities have a life cycle, a lifespan with different stages, different steps, that on the one hand, they can help the community grow and open up, but also sustain it over time because this sustainability and this endurance is uh, also very or are also very important. So the first two steps um, in creating and fostering the, these communities of practice um, will be uh, to inquire and to design the actual community. Um, as you'll have to find common ground, establish a common vision that can motivate and keep the community together. Okay, this will help define activities, decide what technologies you, you are going to use, and also clarify the different roles within the community. You will have to decide how you are going to communicate, who are you bringing into the community, who your partners will be, and eventually you will be ready to test or prototype the, um, this, this community. Um, so in terms of prototyping or piloting, what, you, what is usually done is that you 
check the waters. You check and confirm that the community is in fact viable. Uh, you prove the design, you use pilot audiences, preliminary uh, tests, um, pilot events, uh, and this will help refine the community, build a stronger identity, um, strengthen the, the, the structure, and which uh, this will ultimately evolve and result in the launch and the growth of the community, which are the two following um, following stages. So your community will, will reach a wider audience with new people joining in, uh, spreading the word, generating this sort of um, organic uh, uh, engagement, gaining momentum. Always bearing in mind the concept of openness, co-creation, active participation. Different people will be working uh, together, focusing on shared goals, uh, having shared interests. And as the community grows, it will eventually level, uh, level off and hopefully be able to sustain itself by continuously drawing on its, on its members um, and reflecting about its uh, own role and what it wants to achieve. So this will require critical mass and hopefully it will continue to evolve. And that being said, we now have an example or a platform that can actually help create and uh, develop uh, communities of practice. Thank you, Sandra. <clears throat> Well, actually, I have to start by uh, thanking Irina as well for the invitation. And in particular, because um, from what I heard until now, this, our last presentation, somehow brings together several ideas that um, uh, the panelists stressed. And uh, uh, it shows that we really um, are uh, going on the same path. So starting with the project that we have here at um, Aveiro, I will try to show you. This is the, the project's um, initial website. And in fact, its goal was to um, uh, enable collaboration and sharing of innovative uh, teaching and learning uh, strategies especially addressing higher education, but in terms of um, how it works, its practices, I think it, it, it generally applies to other levels as well. So it, within this project, uh, 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 a platform was developed and this um, platform that is now available, it was just launched a few weeks ago, so we are still in that step four <laughs> kind of uh, moment. Um, the, it was structured in a way that, um, as I was saying, meets some of, of, of the aspects that Elena at the beginning, but also Stella and Jochem um, pointed out, uh, especially because the idea is to bring together uh, teachers, uh, researchers from all around the world and uh, uh, start discussing and developing um, shared co-created practices. So um, the platform is structured in, in three different levels. So we do have hubs that are at the macro level um, where we define the topics after uh, uh, having some kind of survey or making, or making sure that people are really interested in the topic. Afterwards, we have groups and we, also, we can also create discussions as we will present later on. So the idea is to ultimately share um, uh, not only information, but also our uh, competences in the creation of something new. So um, I think I still have some time and going to one of the hubs, for instance, this one is moderated by me. That's why I feel so comfortable <laughs> presenting it. Um, 
it really connects with what Elena mentioned as to the internationalization of the curriculum. This is one of the key aspects that we are considering now at the university and collaborative online international learning is a way to develop it. So how did we create this hub? First of all, we, we, we went through step one, two and three. We, we tried to, to check if the, our community was interested in this. It took us about one year, one year and a half to fully uh, explain and collect our peers' um, uh, points of view as to if it was a, a, a good uh, opportunity to bet on. So we do have uh, information on how it works. We started already sharing uh, resources uh, that are uh, mostly in open access and not only from the conceptual point of view, but from the practical point of view, because this is what people are really looking for, seeing how other colleagues are doing it, peers. And actually, if you sign in and uh, registration is already available for all of those that want, and sorry, if you sign in, um, we would like to show you what we did until now, very shortly. Uh, within the hub that I just presented to you, we, we started by um, uh, stating the goals of this uh, partial community, even though everybody can be in every other hub. And this is very important. To, there are here two aspects in this post that are key from our point of view when starting a community of practice, setting the goals and call to action. So we started by... Um, defining the goals according to our initial survey uh, and the results we got, and also to um, uh, call to action as to inviting participants to comment on what they would like to see discussed. But then we also created groups, and these groups can be public or private. Just to give you an idea, we created a private group um, uh, Avedo team for COIL, where, well, I, I, I'm so sorry, it is in Portuguese, <laughs> exactly because it could be in Lithuanian or any other language, uh, but it is exactly to, to, to have a corner where we feel at home and we can actually discuss further action. And here we also decided to define the goals of this um, uh, group within uh, Coil uh, Hub, and here we we have uh, an opportunity to see we, what our peers are interested in, and to actually think of matching possibilities. Which universities are they interested in, and how can we uh, somehow help to find the perfect match to develop Coil projects? Uh, in the end, uh, we, we also would like to show you a discussion. Um, this kind of, of opportunity is different from the ones above uh, because it has a starting date and a due date. And in this case, we decided to open a call for chapters for um, a book that we're trying to publish on um, that will be used kind of a, a showcase of uh, COIL projects. So you are all invited if you want to jump in or if you have, for instance, examples. But here in the other hubs, you can also find other calls for, um, for publications in the pedagogical area uh, and uh, other information that you, you, you can find. I don't know if you have uh, a, a, any doubts regarding this, but yes, this is the link that you can use. I don't know, Sandra, if you can uh, copy it eventually and share it with our um, audience in, in the chat, mm -hmm. or I can do it now while you grab Thank it. Thank you, Jochen, <laughs> for sharing the link. It's there. Thank you. And just to wrap um, up our presentation, of course, what better image to use in this 
kind of connected image. Uh, image. And based on the whole concept of communities of practice and the discussions we had this morning, uh, becoming an open teacher is, is a process. And going back to that step-by-step -step kind of analogy and image, um, you can start small. And if you're patient and you let your ideas breathe and sink in and take shape. And if you trust yourself, you trust the process, you trust, you trust your peers, you can actually go um, a long, long way. And just to reinforce this idea of collectiveness and of community. So first of all, we would like to reinforce the invitation to take part in the uh, Eden's uh, open week. I think the invitation is in the in the next uh, slide, the official invitation. Because I mean, this idea of community, we can go further together. That's one of the the messages we would like to stress. And finally, also uh, just to finish things up, just to express again our solidarity with everyone in the in Ukraine at the moment. So we have to save the date here for the conference. And. Um, again, express our solidarity, particularly to those who continue to teach even in such harsh conditions. So thank you very much for your attention. And now we will be available for your questions. Thank you so much for a very, very warm and uh, really uh, summarizing, I would say, ideas, uh, presentation. I see that still people are very interested to, to, to have a link to collab space. So mm -hmm. to, uh, yes, thank you for reposting it. And also thank you, uh, the team of Adero also for reminding and inviting people to uh, Eden annual conference that will take place uh, this year in Tallinn. I also give you the link here for, for more information. Now we almost uh, complete our session. We still have one minute or a couple of minutes left. Uh, taking this chance, uh, really, I would like uh, to uh, say, uh, to express my gratitude uh, to people working uh, in the area of teacher education, uh, taking care of uh, the policy, education policy, uh, but also working in the front of European projects, leading projects uh, on teacher skills, on teacher collaboration, on opening up of education, teacher training, and also uh, many, many other things that contribute to our potential to collaborate in the open space and, and to give uh, new competences, new experiences, and of course, recognition. Uh, so before closing the session, I invite maybe all panelists to say, the final, let's say, <laughs> word in the session uh, towards um, reaching our overall aim and objective in the session. Uh, we already heard um, wishes and maybe recommendations uh, to take small steps, but uh, now maybe uh, each of you would like to uh, give some, uh, express some, some idea or some comment or some reflection that we can take with us uh, after the session. So please, uh, I, I, I can call you by names, but I can also so maybe allow you. I see Anna now in the big screen. Uh, so for, for all of us to be open and um, to help our teachers to become open, what would you uh, wish? Well, in fact, I think we have to bet more on being open-minded, being open to, to what we are not used to, being feeling comfortable to, to, to leave our comfort zone. And I think with the, if we can actually uh, get our peers to think, to consider more being open to the world in a very <laughs> general sense, uh, th that will be a great step in higher education. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Anna. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, I think that uh, we have to be uh, united in be open-minded. So I can take the good uh, uh, words from Anna Balula and I, I like her, I think that open-minded is uh, the correct uh, movement. Uh, open-minded and be united. Uh, we can now show to the world 
how Europe can do a lot of things if united. Um, it is not just uh, a matter of one person or a sector, or but be united all together to be open-minded. Uh, just in this way, maybe we can give our contribution for a better world. Thank you very much, Elena. Yes, <laughs> Colleagues? I'll just maybe say one sentence that I would just encourage everyone. It's never uh, too late to open up and there are a lot of ways how to do it. So let's start with ourselves and of course we will see results soon. Thank you. And uh, seconding to Estella, it's, uh, it's about practicing. You may not uh, uh, grow if you do not practice and get uh, into your um, unknown uh, from your comfort zone and the more you practice the more you open yeah. thank you Elena, Jochen please well um, I believe that um, educators who have not yet adopted open practices um, have good reasons to do so. Uh, so uh, one is the copyright issue of the uh, resources that they're using, uh, for which there might be um, licensing agreements on national level, but if they make it avail available openly, then uh, uh, on, the, on the wider uh, net, then um, they don't have the license. And also, Another issue is the confidence of their own uh, teaching that they then make uh, available uh, uh, and visible where, where they know their own slides, their own uh, concepts still have room for improvement. And uh, then they... Um, um, it takes a lot of courage courage to be an open educator. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Johan. And we have Sandra and Antonio left, please. <laughs> well, if I may. Uh, well, no, one of the things that I would say uh, in a nutshell, and which uh, comes in, in, in line with what was being said before, uh, is that you should not be afraid of taking risks. Uh, taking risks is one way, of, uh, although it might sound a bit frightening at the beginning, uh, if you are willing to take risks and uh, keep steady on the path of going uh, more open, more flexible, then you are on the right track to success, I should think. Thank you, Antonio. Sandra, please. Too much pressure to <laughs> be the last one, but just, you know, taking in everyone's um, contributions and words, of course, being open-minded, this idea of being willing to take risks. I would probably round it off with this idea or this old saying that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. So just to kind of have this idea of support and community, that's a good message that we can take from today's session, maybe. Thank you very much, all of you. Yes, I really think we all are under pressure being perfect, but we need to decrease a little bit expectations from ourselves and from the audience. And I think support each other in this, in this challenging, but very interesting and rewarding way. Thank you for your openness, for your sharings. Thank you very much for the attendance and your comments and appreciations. We complete the session. Today we will have one more session in Eden Open Education Week. Please follow uh, the information on the website and looking forward to see you in Eden events. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 And thank you to all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.